Are you ready for one of the funnest times of your whole life? Isn't it great to study the Bible and have it be fun? Yes. Not some kind of an obligation, oh, i got to read these verses. It's like, wow, to make the Bible come alive. Let's welcome Danny Bengigi. Come on up here. Yay! Let's give him a standing ovation. He is fantastic. We so appreciate Dr. Danny. I want to say, uh, uh, you can be hooking this up if you want. I just want to, yeah. Jill, if you want to help him, come up and help him. Do you want to go ahead, Jill? Help him get his laptop. Oh, it's okay. You want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, you can be seated. I just want to say a little bit about this most wonderful man who I greatly respect and admire. Uh, how many of you have ever heard him teach before? Who has not ever heard him teach before? You are all in for a big surprise. Uh, he is an Israeli, and uh, he is probably one of the best Hebrew teachers in all of Israel. Just like you have English teachers teaching English students, he is the Hebrew teacher who teaches Hebrew to the Hebrews. All right, I mean, he is often called upon from um, people high up in Israel to make sure he has his, the English when they're trying to communicate something over here. Uh, he even taught Hebrew at Arizona University, right? Yeah, Arizona State University. Uh, he was one of the professors there. But he knows Hebrew probably more than any other Hebrew speaker knows. But not only that, everyone knows what's... I have two bottles for him. There's one here and there's another one down here. But here's the thing. He has a wonderful daughter named Noga that we personally know. He's got several grandkids that we personally know, and right now they are active in the battle in Israel. One of them is even in Gaza. Okay, so here's a man who is committed to Israel, who's committed. I mean, his three grandkids, he's always trying to find out how they're doing, what's going on. Uh, but on top of uh, that, uh, he has several books that he's authored, and we have a lot of the books downstairs that you can order, and you can order uh, online, and uh, it's uh, Hebrew World One, or what is the, your website? HebrewOne.com. HebrewOne.com. So I want everyone uh, live streaming all over the world and all the United States, go to HebrewOne.com. If you want to really learn the Hebrew language like you've uh, never heard it before, and we're so grateful to him. Uh, and he's just a good friend. We love him. Yay! Yeah. Thank you. I love Pastor Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was kind of overly, overly exaggerated, you know, <laughs> overly. So now I need to live up to at least 5% of what he said about me. That will, even that will be tough, you know. Um, I want to say one thing, I really don't want to turn it into a, although I'm kind of boiling and burning inside of what's happening in Israel, and I would say one word, you know, just very shortly about that before we go to the Torah. Um, some years ago, um, I knew someone, I had a radio show, it was, a it was called The Taste of Israel, and my director was the daughter of a senator, a U.S. senator. And she told me some of the secrets of how do the senators and congressmen, especially senators, shape up their opinion and what do they think of uh, views and ideas of their constituencies, people in their constituency, in constituency. And I find out to my surprise that they value very much handwritten letters. Not that much of emails, and at that time your faxes worth more, the multiply a fax that they received by 120 and an email by, I don't know, 60 or 40, but the handwritten one is a very effective way to reach. Because if somebody took the time and the effort to write in handwriting and sign his name and put a regular U.S. postal stamp, it meant that there are many others that think the same way, but there are the silent spiral, which is common in every society, you know? So uh, in a big conference in, in Florida, and there was a man, <clears throat> he was the head of the, that group there at the time, and he said, we want to help Israel. And he was a lieutenant colonel in the 
you know, ex you know, military, US military, and say, I want to take a gun and fight for Israel. I said, this is great, but that's not what real Israel needs. What they really need is to show your heart and sympathy through the regular, normal channel that American citizens should use. And it's still a great democracy. So my suggestion was that instead of taking guns and, and not instead of prayer, prayer is always a great thing, but take a simple letter, handwritten, write it in handwriting, find out your senator and congressman in your area, and I'm talking about here and in other places that people are watching us, and write a personal letter to your senator or congressman and stay, say and state your support for Israel, that would be a dramatic, substantial, important thing that you can do as believers because we are really not fighting here a regular, ordinary war. It's the, it's the forces of love and God against the forces of evil. And Pastor already mentioned a few steps here of what they do. This is really the tip of the iceberg of the atrocities that has been done there. I don't want even want to get there. But it's the worst of the good and the, and the godly against deep, evil, satanic forces. And I can't even spare words to describe the full magnitude of what's happening there. But you probably know, you watch news, you're getting about large part of what's happening, but not all. It's not all. And you know, you're looking at the media, take for instance the BBC, you know, the one that is so great in World War II, and the BBC itself is, and it's not only the BBC, it's a lot of the media around the world are hasty to take the point of view of Hamas, the savages, the forces of evil, without even checking the facts. And we're talking about the glorious institution of, or institu of, of, media, and then they never apologize for the mistake. Well, they kind of built up some wording there, no apology. And that sentiment is penetrating into American media too. I mean, to a some lesser degree, but you can still see traces of that here. If, well, they didn't quote, okay? But the, the last search in Israel, they find out that in that big so-called bombing of the hospital, which is not the hospital, it was parking lot, that really happened because of a mislaunch missile of, of the Islamic Jihad, even there they calculated between 30 to 100 people, which is terrible if they are innocent, uninvolved people, but not 500 in American media. I'm watching several, ABC and other, they're still repeating that number. So they are slow to adapt to the facts. And this is the time when false information Overruled. This is a war between false and truth. And you would suspect the pastor is here showing a lot of things in the last several months of replacement theology. And replacement theology has roots in anti-Semitism. It's not such like a mistake that happens. It's very intentional. And I can hear and I can hear these traces of the hatred of the children and the chosen people originally of God even reflecting in the media here. So it's not automatically, you know, um, <laughs> even, okay, let, let's, let's, let me stop here because I can go, this is really a, an issue that burns in my, my soul. So we'll go to the Torah portion. We'll do it now in a school style, except for I'm going to add, if, you, if I may, something that you normally don't, are not exposed to. I want to add, the point of view of what we read with some Hebrew nuggets that it's very easy to miss. So you can read the story, the narrative. You know, there are upper level and there is a lower level <laughs> of what we read. It's kind of hidden information. Very minute, very small, but dramatically, dramatically important. I've been talking to pastor like several times a week, you know, and we start yelling at one another on the phone of excitement, of excitement. <laughs> And he's still one of the greatest teachers that I've ever had, you know. And people in Israel know him. I'm introducing him to a lot of Israelis and say, watch that, because when it comes, I mean, I'm, you know, he's like a, like a scientist, Pastor Mark builds, like a scientist detective, you know, like he's sitting with a the lab. They sit with microscopes and all kind of equipment. 
He is sitting with Bible timings. He knows to calculate timing of what happened and how old was this during that time. It's like he's been there. I'm looking at him. Doesn't doesn't look old enough, <laughs> but but he knows it as though from an inside information. But, you know, at the beginning, I you know I met Pastor Robin. Said, ah, exaggeration. How does he know all this stuff? But little with the years, I start. Yeah, I'm, who am I to test him? You know. But I checked. You know, Pretty startling, and and some Israelis that are very skeptical of you know um, pastors in America. Well, they start seeing the power. You need to be on Israeli television one time, you know. But anyway, Israel needs to learn something for you too, big time. Anyway, I want to kind of uh, go over that like in a school style. We'll read it as a simple narrative. You all know the story, the biblical story, but I'll try to bring in those important and interesting points. Saying that, I'm asking you now to concentrate on two characters in Hebrew. And you'll see how interestingly they are interwoven into the whole narrative of our portion. And it's throughout the Bible. But here, the two characters is Bet. How many of you still, well, if you don't know Hebrew, this is the time. Jump in. It's part of your own DNA. You know, in the moment you're born, you don't realize it. But if I have time, I'll go over it, you know. But learn Hebrew. Those two letters are Bet and the letter Lamed. They are the equivalent of the B and L in English. B and L. And I'll show you how interestingly they are interwoven into the biblical story, especially of this one that we read now. Let's read that story. For those of you who forgot, we'll read it as a narrative. We'll go over it. It's very long. I try to skip certain areas. Um, Mainly of genealogy, this is the area of Pastor Mark, you know, but we'll go. So these are the whereabouts of Noah. He was, a, and you probably all know, and a lot of books and commentaries written about that subject, that he was, the word here is not just adjustment, it says here, and perfect, you know. But in Hebrew, tzaddik tamim means righteous and innocent. The word tamim means innocent, okay? But he was innocent at his generations. What does it mean, at his generation? You probably heard that. It's pretty common. Everybody knows. If you don't know, it means, you know, the interpretation of many here is that he was relatively righteous. Not completely righteous, but comparing to the others of his generation, he was righteous. But you all know that. Let's go on. But then the second part of the sentence, he walked with God. Okay? So that you can't be not righteous to walk with God. You walk with him, you're righteous, right? Kind of a little contradiction built in. There are many, but they are not really contradiction. We just don't fully understand them. So we have three sons. Shem, that's the word. Here's where the Semite came from, the idea of Semitic, right? Shem, and it means a name. Whoops. And this is the second part of our study today. The name. We're going to talk about the name. But his name is name, right? And Ham. Pastor spoke about him, and Yefet. And the land was, and I'm doing an impromptu translation from Hebrew to English, so excuse me if I'm not saying it word for word with your English Bible. But Yishachet Aretz Yifne Elohim, and the land was corrupt before God, and its field was Hamas. Hamas is not just, what, what's the translation here, the English, the violence, but it's robbery and violence. It's the two, ex robbery, to rob, you know, burglary and robbery. And look what happened there, even at the event in Israel of Hamas. They broke in and immediately followed, and I don't know if people know that, but we saw the videos, ordinary uh, Gazan citizen from Gaza, along with them, now they're speaking about the number of 3,000 in that surprise attack. And many of them were just civilians, so-called by the media, innocent, uninvolved. I'm not saying that all Gazan people are, but those who came in or ordinary residents that we are now very keen to give them humanitarian aid, so forth, but not to the Israeli hostages that are there that need their medication. Their humanitarian rights are not important right now to the international. And even, I don't want to criticize anybody here, US or, you know, but, okay. So the land was filled with Hamas, and those people, those came, and what did they do? If there was somebody still alive, 
after the Hamas, you know, the, the group of the, their commando left, they killed them, the butcher children, and they looted them. So here is the burglary that we're talking about here, connected to the Hamas. Robbery and violence. Vayar Elohim, Vayar Elohim et ha'aretz v'inei nishchata ki yishchit kol basar et darko la'aretz. Well, God saw that the land is now filled with a lot of um, 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 corruption, and he's watching that, and the whole story of Noah, if you look at it in kind of from a little bit from above, let's say from a drone height level, not from the surface ground level, you will see a story of restart. Restart of restarting, you know? Like you try something, you know, give it a chance for a while, it doesn't work, and God is doing a restart for his creation. And I'll show you another point here of the restart shows really interestingly. So it's it's corrupted and um, okay, and and Noah and God said to Noah, this is the end of all flesh because the land is filled with Hamas, and um, and therefore, and he explains it, he gives the justification, reasoning, and I'm destroying the land, destroying and imashchitam et aritz. Okay. Now here is something very interesting. You're not going to see that in English. I don't know. I don't, we don't even, even talk about it, Pastor. You know, he in your English Bible it says there that God says to him, "Make an ark of gopher wood." Right? That's what you know about the story. But that's not all what he says there. I see the pa pastor is frantically trying to look what is missing there. <laughs> okay, he, there is a one word that he is saying there. He says in Hebrew, ase lecha. The word lecha still has the L there, you know. Lecha, well, not that exaggerated, <laughs> not cha like that. Lecha, softer, okay? The word lecha literally means for yourself, but it does have a soothing, comforting, and slowing effect. I can say to a person, sit down, or in Hebrew, shev lecha, mean shev is sit down, and shev lecha is a soothing, comforting, and slowing down. If I say sit, oh, sit down, you know, even the word sit down, it's like uh, the, the speaker is expecting immediate result. So sit down. You, don't, you can't like uh, stroll and okay, and, uh, no, sit down and sit down. But if I say, if somebody says to you, shev lecha, means take your time, sit down. Soothing, comforting, and slowing the process. And that explains what we were talking here, that it took very long time to build that ark. He didn't say build it. All right, well, you know, urgency. I'm going to destroy the land. Oh, gee, it needs to work double shift or triple shift to the family. No, no, no. No, no, no. How does it say it here? In verse 14, in that chapter, Aselecha, make it for yourself. You hear the take the time here? I wanted to do a good job. Relax, trust me, and don't hurry here. <laughs> you know, the urgency, but God said, oh, the land is filled, all the, da, da, da. but take your time, make it, build it, you know? Okay, the kind of an interesting point here, missed in every single Bible I ever checked, you know? It's not there because they can't translate this lecha. You know, it actually happens also in the next week, um, Torah portion, even in a, greater de in a greater degree. I hope you're gonna be here, because Pastor invited me uh, to do that. It's amazing, amazing Torah portion. But, you know, I mean, I'm giving you a foreshadowing. There is a big time lecha there, you know? Okay, lecha to yourself. Okay, and this is what you do. You build that, and then, and then you know, the size, and that's going to be 300 cubic, and it gives all the information, and you make a, a window there, and I'm going to, and I'm going to bring now. Oh, what did we start with? Uh, I said, keep in mind through two characters in Hebrew, B, and what's the other one? B and L, right? Bal, bel, bal, bal, bal. Okay. And in in verse 17, he says, "Ve'ani hineni." Whoop, twice, and I behold. 
And I, I am, you know, stressing that it's not going to be happening by any other apparatus. I, myself, in English, and behold, I'm, yeah, he does say, I myself, right, good. I myself is bringing the mabul, mabul. You hear the B and L in that word? Well, we're going to meet it again and again and again. Mabul, I'm going, this is the flood. So I'm going to bring the mabul maim, the flood of water to destroy all flesh that has, look at this, look at this, make no mistake, intricate, detailed, okay, well, to destroy all flesh, obvious, we understand what it means, no, any flesh that is still living spirit under the sky, under the sky, heaven, right, wow, full detail, like, really stressing that no one is escaping from that you know that happens again and we're going to talk about it next week in this fascinating um, chapter or chapter fascinating Torah portion the extra detail the principle of make no mistake when God speaks make no mistake and and to say to even put the last nail into that coffin he's saying then everyone on the earth will perish. Well, if that was not enough, obvious before, you know. Look how many excessive details to say this is, God says, his intention. But I will raise and erect my, um, my covenant with you, and you came to the ark, you and, your, you and your sons, look at the order, your sons and your wife and the wives of your sons with you. And bring uh, from every living, <coughs> bring two, <coughs> sorry, to the ark in order to continue the generation. Okay. And the same thing with the, um, with the birds. And take all kind of food that, is gonna be, that it can be eaten and collect it, and that will be for you for eating. And Noah did everything that God commanded him. Followed it to the letter. Okay? And again, two ways. He did everything and that everything that he did. Okay, kind of a double. Making sure, again, he does everything God says. And God says to him, you come, Boata, you come and all your house to the, to the ark. And again, justifies the choice. Why Noah is chosen to be the man that is, has a very, magnif very important part in the restart plan for the earth, for the creation. Because I saw you as a righteous man in front of me in this generation. Once again, he stresses. Why? I could say, I saw you as a righteous man. I chose you. No, but in this generation, I saw you as a righteous man before me. Kind of limiting the, the sentence in the beginning that he walked with God. Why does, why does God need to limit or to kind of decrease the extent of the righteousness of Noah? Big, 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 big writings about that and arguments throughout the generations, but we're not going to stand on this. Well, let's go on. So take from the pure, oh, how did the English go? The clean beast, right? Behemat And you take seven of those seven. Again, the number seven, shiva, seven. Um, and, uh, and look, a very interesting statement comes here. Seven pairs, and the English says, the male and his female. The Hebrew says, a man and his wife. And his wife. Yeah, the ishto, look. Now, why, would, why can't God say, Zachar? and then he says, Zachar v'nekiva. He says it later on, but here it says, talk about the beast, right? The pure, clean beast. And it says seven, 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 twice the word seven, a man and his wife. This is the wording here, which is, again, bewildering. What does wife has to do there when it comes to animals? Do they get married? Do they have ceremonies? Do they lift up the bride? You know, I mean, <laughs> but this is the wording used there in the Bible, and we should never doubt that there is an intention and there are no mistakes in the Bible. Whatever, I need to say that it's a very important thing. English translators, and I'm, again, I'm not talking down at anyone, but 
Pastor and I, and you know, we, we spend, you don't know how much time, you know, we kind of show, mainly pastor shows me and I jump, you know. But there are things that look as though they are mistakes. I'm stressing, as though there are mistakes in the Bible. And uh, many, I can't give you examples now because I, I, how do, where is my time? I need to know where I'm stopping. I'm okay, okay. Um, so many, uh, um, many things that look as though they are mistakes and though they are not. So in Hebrew translations of the Bible, unlike any other language translation of the Bible, we keep what we think looks as though it's a mistake. We keep. So we put in print, you know, we put it in, in, in the word, and then in square brackets on the side to show it's an editorial. This is what we think the word may have been meant to be. But we don't erase what looks as though it's a mistake. It's there in the text. So this is the reason that the Hebrew Bible is intact and it's identical to the one given to Moses on Mount Sinai. In English Bibles, translators throughout the time took the liberty to change that and make it what they think is right. And we're talking about humans here dealing with scriptures, and you understand there is a problem. You will not find two Bibles that has the same uh, wording. You, even the King James, there is a King, King James and the New King James, and if there was a juvenile King James, there would be changes there too. And the NIV and the M, you know, each one of them is different. I mean, some of them to a great degree. And I understand, we understand the importance of that so it can be conveyed to people of different level of language and so on. All right, but what happens if there is a major difference? Wow, the pastor is going to expo expose some, and I'm going to do one here too, um, relating to what we said, the um, replacement theology. But okay, so some of the mistakes are natural, and they are humanly acceptable. We call, you know, this is like human shortcoming when we tell a story. But some, and this is what Pastor Mark has been showing me that he's very keen and very adamant about, those what we call the value embedded departures, okay? Not innocent, value embedded, intentional departures from that. And it doesn't mean that you don't need to love your Bible and even though you do it in your language, it's holy, and it has the spirit, and the spirit counts a lot. But I'm in the area of the words, you know, the spirit too, but somebody needs to kind of check the words, and the pastor does that too in his way too. Okay, so um, man and his wife. Why is that word chosen, and why it was not translated like this in English? I don't know, I'm, you know, <laughs> but it says, ish ishto. It's not a man, and it's not his wife. It's animals, but that's what it says. And twice, not only once, it says it twice. And, and from the beast that is not pure to man and his wife. Okay. And, but in, and also from the, bee, from the birds of the sky, 7-7. Seven, seven, and here it says, for the birds, the words female and male worked. And in, in verse 3 in chapter 7. And also from the, from the birds of the sky, 7-7 seven, seven, male and female, no problem with them, but the pure beast and the unclean beast, man and his wife. Hmm. All right, let's go on. I mean, little stuff, but you don't see that in English, and I thought kind of interesting to share it. Um, so then God says, listen to this, Kili Amim Shiva, again, seven, 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 everything, sabbatical, you know, around seven. Your favorite number, you calculate a lot, you know, with the seven. I'm learning a lot with the seven. The seven years actually means the millennia and so on. Okay, and seven sevens, 49, and the next day is, or the next year, or the next great event is the Jubilee, the Yovel. And wow, what kind of covert, not secrets of mystical character, but astronomical you have been, you, Pastor Mark, is exposing here, you know, I mean, things that are really can be checked scientifically. Not mystical and not cookie stories. Things that NASA can, can confirm. And you see great events, but somebody need to dig them out, you know. You got one here. Okay, because in seven days I am 
Now here comes another very interesting point. I'm going to, mamtir means throwing water from heaven. What's the English word for that? Uh, in English it says, I'll cause it to rain. Kind of a weak expression. In Hebrew, mamtir is like smashing great quantities of water over, you know, over the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I'll wipe out the existence that I created uh, from the face of the earth. And again, this is the first time that, okay, here is the restart about to, believe, about to happen. Restart, I created something, it developed not to the way that I like, I'm not getting here to the way that he anticipated or not, but to the way I like, and I'm going to wipe it out. And Noah did again everything that God told him, verse 5. And then Noah was 600 years when the flood, Mabul, listen to the word, Mabul, and that's the flood, and it has the B and the L. Okay, Mabul, just remember the B and the L in everything that has to do with destruction, confusion, mix-up, B and L are there. So the mabul was water on, the, no, watch the wording, water on or upon the earth, upon the earth. So we get a clear indication, and this is being strongly wired to most brains of people that know years after the story of the flood, okay? So the water came, and ask the typical person, what happened there during the time that God de decided to destroy it? They said, oh, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. No, it did not. So Noah did everything that God commanded him, and he was 600 years, and Noah and his wife and the daughters and the, and the wives, no, Noah and his sons and his wife and the wives of his sons with him came to the, came to the ark, because of the flood, okay? Okay, so now, uh, verse 7, we skip that, you know, we go on. They came to, to, uh, to the ark, in face, verse 9, no longer he called the same creatures, the same beast, he doesn't call them anymore man and wife, and he says, male and female, and this is Noah, what he does, as God commanded Noah. And indeed, God says seven days, and indeed, after seven days, there was the mabul, mabul. You hear the B and L, and that's the flood over the earth, okay? So most people remember, it was like 40 days, 40 night, it rained, and then, yeah, but the water, later on, we learn, it was like on the face of the earth for 150 days, but it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And is that all what happened? No, no. What else happen was happening there? Here it is. Verse 11, and it happened in the year 600, in the, in the age, 600 years to the life of Noah, at the second month, on the 17th of the month in that day, the springs of the gorge under the ground broke, broke, and the home Rabbah means the great gorge, the springs broke, and the and the chimneys in Hebrew are what is the English saying here? And the wind <laughs> windows of heaven were open in Hebrew. The chimneys of heaven were open. Arugo, arubota shamaim. Aruba is the chimney, you know, and those are opening. But basically, the windows. It's a nice. It's go, it's okay. No criticism here. It's fine. Uh, were open. And water came from above, and water came from below. But we need to stop here and think, what really happened during the creation? Okay? You remember, and I can't get into that too much because we have to continue with that, but you, you go check it out in Genesis in the beginning, at the, at the creation. God, Vayavdel, God is separating between two bodies of water, one above and the one below. And he calls the water above heaven, right? Shamaim. And the Hebrew expression of Shamaim already manifests the truthfulness of the story. Because the word for water in Hebrew is maim. And the word for heaven in Hebrew is shamaim. 
So the word heaven includes the word water. So what happened there in the creation? And it's a very important thing and a lot of us missing it. The, the creation itself of the earth separating the water below from the water above and creation begins, right? There is heaven and there is earth. And here comes the destruction and it fits the, exactly the story but in the reverse order. The water above once again joining the water below and bring forth chaos. That's what really, the, the, this is really what happened. He, cre he connects it very clearly with the way he created the earth, where he separated the water. Here he makes them join again and bring about chaos. But again, the next verse forgets about completely about the, the, the gorge, you know, the springs of the gorge. And, say, and the rain was over the land for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay. What about the water below? That's happened, you know. Okay. 40 days and 40 nights. So they, there is kind of like an internal intention here that we'll remember the flood of 40 days and 40 nights. But don't put too much stress about the gorge, the water of the gorge that came out that play even more meaningful role in the destruction than the water from above. And you, you see why, you know? Well, that rained for 40 days, 40 nights, but the, how long does it took the whole thing? 150 days, right? Wow, so where is the water? Still, and it's still, still rising, but the, but the rain stopped after 40 days and 40 nights. Why it was still rising? The water was still rising, going up and up and up and up. Not from the rain, it stopped 40 days, 40 nights, right? That's the evidence you see here. It was rising from below. Much more water came from below and completing the reversal of creation, mostly. Not completely, because there were still people there and there was the ark, what he saved, yeah? And the animals and the birds and so on. So, and that very day, Noah came, and there was Shem and Ham and Yefer, the sons of Noah, and, uh, and the three wives of his, children, of his sons to the, to the ark. And they, and all kind of birds, and then, then let's go on, and the birds of all kinds, and they came to the ark, two, two, from all the flesh that has spirit in it. Flesh with spirit, living. And the next one, look at this. Now, there is something very, very interesting in verse um, 15. I mean, seven, 16. Vabaim, and the, and the coming are male and female. Once again, male and female. Uh, they came as God, as God commanded him. And now God does an extra step. He locks Noah in the ark, right? <laughs> and it says... And the Lord closed him in. So he couldn't get out, right? He, he, God, but he did. At the end, of, I'm jumping to the end of the story. He did open it and got out. But here God locked him in. Is that a symbolic? Is that a symbol that God locks him, seals him inside with whatever he wants to preserve? But he does. You know, he locks Adonai ba'ado, And God locks him there. So it's an intervention in the event, oh, which is like normally a man can do. You know, he can, he can close it, you, you make a door, he can close. No, God does that, you know. He did something else that was not expected of him. The first time the commandments were given, you know, the Torah was given on Mount Sinai, people think, oh, Moses, you know, wrote. No, it was written with the finger of God the first time. God himself had to write it down, you know, right? And here, God himself is part of the story. In literature, later on, they developed something in kind of European, it's in the Western literature. It's a principle that later on is extended and it's every fable in every story. It's called Deus Ex Machina. Deus Ex Machina is the intervention or the, the, the I don't want to say interference, but the appearance of the, of the divine intervention in the regular life of ordinary people, when God takes an action. Basically, all story of miracles on earth that happen to people, suddenly it's the divine intervention or the divine providence, you know, that is protecting. And God, and he takes an action here. He closes the, 
it closes it over. It's almost like a theatrical, you know, like the, 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 the stage is closing, God is closing it, and the event start. And again, Vayihir Mabul, and the, and the flood was Mabul, again, B and L, but Mabul, Mabul, Mabul. 40 days, Mabul, 40 days on the earth, and the water increased, and they carried the ark, and it was raised from, from over the earth. And the water increased a lot. You can see the elements of a great biblical description or narrative or, or a story. You know, the water increased very much over the earth. And the boat or the ark was going over the water. But there was something different here in the going. I'll show you it later, OK? So in, in, again, a kind of a personi personification here. And it says, and the boat and the ark walked on the water. Vatelech. Look, and again, the word lech. Remember when we say about lech? OK? Now look at that. Vatelech hateva, and the English, of course, says, well, it's not word for word. You can't do that because, but why not then? Why in Hebrew couldn't say, and the boat float, floated, right? Was floating over the water. Why walked? Why is the use of the Hebrew here? And the ark, it said, well, English is pretty good. Went upon the face of the water. Went is kind of close to walk, right? You understand it was like carried, but in Hebrew is more explicit. It walked on the water. Do you remember anybody else walking on water? Oh, you do? Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> okay, but it walked. I mean, you get the picture here. The, the ark is like, excuse my... Uh, <laughs> Flip. <laughs> I didn't want the camera to see that. But anyway, I'm wearing sandal, you know. Um, so it walked on the water. And the water, again, the story is amazing. The water increased very, very much. Me'od, me'od. Twice the word. Me'od, me'od. What does the English say? And uh, exceedingly, right. Yeah, me'od, me'od. Very much, very much. And the top, the hit at the top of the mountain of the tall mountains was covered under the sky. Okay, and then we're skipping them. And then, um, anyone that has a living spirit in his nostrils, you know, in the above, uh, they died, they perished. This is very, very strong words. And he wiped out what's the English and every living. Substance was destroyed. Ha! Weak expression. Destroyed, very strong, but weaker comparing to the Hebrew. Yimach is wiped out. Like, you know, there is some dirt or something really bad. It has the connotation of like, you know, you not just destroyed. Destroyed is okay, we got it. We understand what happened. But Yimach, you know, by the way, may he blotted out. That's Yimach, blotted out. So when we talk about um, like Hitler or some kind of great enemy, we'll say, may his name be blotted out. Yimach Shmo. His name be blotted out. That's the word, wiped out. And here is what it says. This is a very strong, the strongest of the, in the entire Bible of God's action, by the way. The strongest and the most severe expression. Vayimach et ayikum asher al pnei adama. You can feel there is also an emotional uh, feeling of disgust and 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 complete, you know, uh, repulsive uh, attitude that God had because He wiped it out. He, 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 you can in that word there is disgust, there is anger, there is animosity, but mainly strong disgust. Okay, English had enough with he destroyed. Okay. Destroyed, but look at the yes, five minutes. What? Okay, so we'll take a break here, right? And we'll continue that when we come back. I will have to go more with this chapter, but I promise you, we'll do leave the room for what you got in the paper. Thank you so much. We'll see you right after the break. Thank you. Let's give him a big hand. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to uh, pray here in just a second. Um, how many of you enjoyed what you heard? Does it give you a whole new view? Uh, one thing that, I, I, that really uh, struck me that I thought was kind of fascinating, 
about what he said. Just yesterday in the news was a great big article that said there, there has been a massive ocean discovered beneath the Earth's crust, more water than what's on the surface. And so it's these waters that were coming up like through the crust. It wasn't just the waters above and the waters that we see in the ocean. A massive amount of water is beneath the Earth's crust that is far more than the other one. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention, what's the eighth month called in Hebrew? What's the eighth month? What's the seventh month? Tishri is the seventh month. So what's the eighth month? Keshvan. But guess what it was called before it was called Heshvan? Bull. That's in 1 Kings 6.38. It was called Bull because that was the month when the flood took place. So with that said, let's stand and we'll pray. And we'll have a little break. We'll come back, have some worship. And then we'll jump back into Danny's wonderful teaching. Avina Malkainu, our Father, our King, uh, we just thank you so much again for your word. And we don't want to just know your word. We want to be intimately connected to your word. We want to really know your word in depth, not just on surface, and be happy that uh, we've read the Bible once and, and think that justifies us. No, God, we want to penetrate deep into your word. We want to not only understand your word, but your heart beat. Even as uh, Danny had mentioned that you were totally disgusted. God, we got our emotions from you. And I just pray that as everyone reads their Bible, they would pick up the emotions that you have uh, toward what we read and what is the bigger picture. So I just thank you so much again for all those who are live streaming from all over the world and all of those who are here right now who invest in taking your Torah to the nations. God, this is all about being a light. And in the times of darkness, this is when the greatest light is going to be shining. So I thank you for all those who are investing in taking your light to the nations. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with the, your truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. But anyway, how many of you enjoyed Danny's sermon? Yay! We want to make sure to give him enough chance to finish what he was teaching, and then he's going to jump into another teaching that I am really excited about. Let's welcome Dr. Danny Bangigi. Thank you, everybody. Okay, let's continue. I'm trying to be economical with your time. I don't want to hold you for too long. Let's continue. We'll just quickly finish the entire um, Torah portion, and then we'll get to the most fascinating subject on earth. Um, one of them, okay? <laughs> one of them. So the Mabul was for 40 days and 40 nights, and the ark was now raised from the earth, and the water increased very much. Did, it? did we read that? No. And um, yeah, we did read that. Okay, so everybody died. <clears throat> And the water increased for 150 days. And not because of the rain so much, but it because of the water from below. So now we're going to chapter 8 now. And uh, God remembered. And God remembered. He remembered? So where was he during this whole time? What is he doing? So he said, oh, wait a second. I do have this guy there on the, on the boat, you know. And God, God remembered Noah. And the animal and all the beasts that are with him on the boat, on the ark. And he put, sp not spirit, but ruach. It could be wind or spirit. And as that going over the water, the water recited, got quiet. Again, you know, ruach, you may think it just as the wind did that, or the spirit of God again over the earth. Look at Genesis 1. The Ruach, remember Genesis 1? It's not just wind. Because it says there, Elohim merachefet al pnei 
and the, in, in the Genesis 1. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. And that was creation. And here again, remember, it's a restart. And that's why you see that it's not just the wind. They put the wind and the water stopped. It's the Spirit of God went over. It's a restart. It's a recreation in a way. Okay? And... Um, Okay, and then the the uh, the springs of the gorge closed, and also the chimneys of heaven, or you say the windows of heaven closed, and the rain stopped from the sky. But the rain was raining only for forty days and forty nights. This is the hundred and fiftieth day or something, right? Much later. But let's let get into the timing here. But we know that uh, we made sure there's no water from below and no water anymore from above. And the water recited, receded from the face of the earth. And and look, haloch vashuv. It's something I want to stand on, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. But it says here, and the water returned from the earth continually. The words in Hebrew, interestingly enough to think about, I didn't solve the problem yet. Haloch vashuv. Haloch vashuv. It means in Hebrew, back, I mean, Back and forth, forth and back. What does that mean? The water went haloch vashov. In English, means grad. It translated gradually, but in Hebrew, it says haloch vashov. Went forward and backward, forward in and backward. Like sound, like it. Yeah, it does remind us a tide, right? But well, haloch vashov. It could also indicate the process, you know. It means that expre this expression is also used in modern Hebrew. So let's not mix them up. It could be that it means a gradual process of reciting, little by little, you know, haloch vashov. And the water was missing, or you know, and the, at the end of 150 days, and the and the ark rested on the 70 on the on the seventh month on the seventh month. On the 17th of that month, on the mounts of Ararat. And again, the water went more and more, lessening, lessening, until the 10th month, on the 10th, here by Siri, by Echad Lachodesh, on the first day of the month. What day was that, right? Rosh Hashanah. And, and then the top of the mountains were seen. And after 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he made. And he said the raven, by the way, similar word, or rev, raven, just backwards, same word in English and in Hebrew. And he sent the raven, um, or rev, and again, he, yatso vashov. Now that here is almost like haloch vashov. Haloch vashov means goes and back, comes and back. And the raven is yatso, yatso vashov, gets out and coming back. That we know. The raven went and it came back. But it's the same expression using here for the water. So it's more than just gradually residing because it's the same expression. Yatso vashov, come going out and coming back in until the dryness of the water from over the face of the earth. Somebody, a person here asked me at the break. And I was like, hmm, you know, good question. And it's like, okay, so everything was wiped off. What happened to all the fish? and the creature of the sea. And then we, I couldn't get an answer, but then I'm thinking again, I need to check every verse again in reverse checking. But he did say that he wiped the life on the face of the earth, right? So it was a great benefit to be a fish at the time. I don't know, you know, you want to be, <laughs> yeah, it sounds fishy to you. <laughs> and he sends the dove from him to see if the water has been raised, you know, hakalu hamaim. And the, and the dove did not find a rest for its feet. And it came back to the ark because there was still water on the earth. And he sent it, his hand. You get, the, you get that. Very nice. He puts his hand and she comes, she comes back to him to the ark. And he waited another seven days and he sent the, and he sent the dove again. The dove again. Yonah. It's the same name. But the, the same name but as Jonah, the prophet. Yonah is Yonah. Same name. And the Yonah, the... the, Yuna, the um, uh, the dove came back to him at evening time, and a lezite and a leaf of a of a branch of a olive in its mouth. Olive, olive. What is olive symbolizes to you? 
Mount of Olives. What is the symbol of olive? And peace, right? Olive. It's peace, right? So the, and the peace is the opposite of the chaos. And there was again chaos here. And she brings him, you know, like it's a very symbolic. She brings him a, an olive, a little olive branch or leaf, right? And she brings and she indicates the peace. And, the complete, and this is the completion of the restart, but not completely. And Noah knew he needed that. Uh, he knew that the water now receded from the face of the earth. And he waited another seven days, and he sent again the dove, and she did not come back to him anymore. And it happened, okay, and Noah, now Noah removes, as pastor said here, he removes the covering of the ark, God sealed it, and he removes it. So was it, how did, how did it really happen? Was it locked from outside, and now he removes it, and he gets out? <clears throat> we don't know. There's no biblical answer for that. So we just have to believe. And it happened in the second month, <clears throat> and Beshiva, in the, on the 27th day, on that month, the second month, right? The land was dry, the land. And God spoke to Noah to say, now here we get something very interesting. <clears throat> he said, Tse. Now, not in a Susie way anymore. Before that, he said, build to yourself. And next week, we're going to talk about the importance of those words, of the softening, soothing, and slowing down expression. Here, no more. He said to him, in a way, get out. That's a command. That in Hebrew, there is a tense called the imperative. You don't have it in English as a tense. It's just a word, you know. But in Hebrew, it's an imperative. <clears throat> and he commands him, get out of the boat, of the ark. Not like he told him to get in. No, take your time to get in, you know, long time. No, take your time. B'nelcha, build it for yourself. No, here, a clear-cut command. Very short, very swift, and, and the expectation is an immediate result. So there is no more time for delay. The restart process is, 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 is done. You, your wife, and the, chi- and, and, the do- and the son, I mean, the wives of your children with you. All the animal, and, the, 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 and they come out, and now they multiply on the land, and Noah and his son got out. Okay. And Kolachai, okay, they all got out, and Noah built a shrine, that's the word here, and built an altar, okay, to God, and he took from all the pure animal he had enough, remember, seven of each, right? And all the birds, and the pure bird, or they call the key, clean bird, and he, re, uh, he did the sacrifice. Now, here is a personifica- personification of God. You know, he's not that much different than we are, according to the Bible, you know? So God smelled that wonderful smell of the offering, and he said in his heart, he said to himself, in his heart, and he said in his heart, okay, uh, no, th- this smells so good. This is so nice what they've done. I'm no longer going to curse the earth. Is that, is that what happened? I mean, that was the whole temptation for God to do that. I mean, you give him a nice meal there. Say, that smells so good. I'm not going to do it anymore. I mean, that was really good, you know. But he says something very important. For <clears throat> the desire of the heart. How does the English put it? Yetzer Adam. Uh, yeah, of, okay. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Well, I don't know where they put imagination of man's heart. Yet there is the, hmm, the primal desire of people. Yet there, you know, like, like something that is compelling and you can't really help it. Or to that extent, that's the word yet there. In a very strong desire, Yetzer Akiyum is the, is the, how do you say, the built-in, intrinsic desire, strong desire of survival, and so on, and so on. There are, this is Yetzer, very strong word of people. That, so he knows, and he said, for the desire of the heart of man is evil from its youth, you know, and I'm not going to hit anymore any living as I did. <clears throat> not any, not any living, because that really does not, not t- stand the test of reality. God did hit, but not the entire at the same time. Okay, so loss at kol chai. The word is called. The emphasis is on all. 
I'm not going to destroy all living anymore as I did. Okay, now, uh, and that is, uh, he also put the conditions of this kind of uh, statement. This is going to happen while the earth remain, seed time and harvest, which the pastor is teaching here all those years, the time and season, and how those really intersect with big event in the history, right? Cold and heat, that's another mandatory thing, as long as there is cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. As long as all that is happening, I'm not going to do it again. Basically, that everything that we know in this kind of life, right? Okay, this is a reset, but now to complete the reset, what did he do right after the creation? He told Adam, Adam, Adam Chava, Ad, Adam and Eve, multiply. And the same wording is here. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Word for word, what he said in Genesis 1. It's, again, restart of the earth, you know. And you'll be the fear of the animals on the, on the ground and even the, the birds in the sky and the creepy, um, yes, and all the fish too, the fish that are given in your hand. So man is in control of animals. And that was also, he told Adam, you'll control them, you'll give them the names. God didn't give the names. Men did give names, right, to the animals, right, in Genesis. And interestingly enough, he's providing the new dietary laws. And he says, even moving things, Every moving things thing that lives shall be food for you. Talk about creepy stuff on earth, right? Moving. What is moving on, you know? <laughs> because the word is remis in the beginning. That's creepy. You know, these are stuff that crawling on the ground. Hmm. But it will be like the green, greenery um, that I gave you everything. Okay. But here comes a very important principle, a very important principle of the meat and the blood, okay? And Jewish law keeps it very, very strictly until this very day. This is the important part of kosher, right? So, uh, but flesh with its life, which is its blood, you should not eat. And if you do that, I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to, God says, and, and surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, will I require it. And at the hand of men, at the hand of every man's brother will I require that life of man. And he continued that, and he says that whomever does that, ki betzelem Elohim asa et ha'adam. Now why, he explains here, interestingly, why he's going to be so adamant and strict about that issue of killing other creatures, human beings, human beings. And he explains it here in verse 6 of chapter 9. Because in the image of God, he made men. But if you go back, it's not in our chapter. You look there, the image of God in there, you know, it, God is doing it not alone, the creation of men. Not alone. He, he says there, Betzalmenu kidmutenu. Let us, in plural, let us main, make men in our shape at our image. So there are two words here in Hebrew. Shape and image. What does it mean? Why not to get the, the, the looks of God? No, he had to use two words, the shape and the image. What's the difference and why there is such a thing? Apparently, there is more than one facade or one uh, characteristic of resemblance between, between God and man and mankind. So the shape... We probably understand for that that we look like God, you know, apparently what is done in his image. You know, we can't look different if we are done like in a mold of God. But what is the other word there? The other word probably means that we are also received some of the inner abilities of God. And you know it's true because look how far man has reached just because of the first sin of stealing from the tree of knowledge. And we know there, I don't have time to stay on this whole subject, but it's an amazing. Uh, when he chases men away from paradise, from Gan Eden, he says, I got to do that, lest they'll eat from the other tree, 
and that's a tree of life, and they will be just like us. Wow. So they stole from one, they stole from the tree of knowledge. This is not the tree of knowledge, just, you know, what you think. It's the whole science, the whole idea of science, the knowledge, is uh, the, 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 the ability to differentiate between right and wrong. We call it good and bad in the moral standards, but in science, it's the empirical. That's the empirical research, which is the base and ground of every science. You test something, you see it works fine, didn't work, tried something else. The trial and error, the good and bad, we stole that piece of information. And he said, we can't be, you can't be here anymore. Remember, we made in his shape and his image. If he stay there, he says, it's in Genesis. If he eats from that, and the, they will be just like us. Elohim. They will be like God, got to be away. And we did not have the internal life in that form. You know, the resurrection comes and, and fills up that gap. Okay, so why is not going to do that? Because he made man in the image of God. Here he's using only one word, Betzelem Elohim. And you, prove, multiply and be fruitful in, in the land and so on. And God, and God said to Noah and his sons to say, I am keeping my covenant with you and your seeds after you. I'm, I'm sorry about I'm doing a quick impromptu translation because I'm reading it in Hebrew. I'm trying to save time. I'm doing it quicker this way than reading it in English. Okay, say it again. And there will be no more mabul, BL again. There will no, be no more BL. That is the agent, the agent of chaos. That word is the agent of chaos on earth, B and L. I'll show you more of that in a second. Okay, this is the, okay, so he puts the uh, arrow, I mean the bow. I'm trying to fast up. And I put my bow in the cloud, and that was the sign of the covenant between you and the earth, and it was in the, in the clouds, and the, you know, we saw the rainbow. And I remembered my covenant, Briti, between you, between me and yourself, and between every soul that has flesh, and there'll be more, no more water, again, the promise is the third time here, there'll be no more water to destroy all flesh. And then we go, and Noah said, okay, again, the covenant, and the sons of Noah coming out, and there is Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan, Okay, Canaan, you say in Hebrew, Knaan. I don't know, there is some subject here, Pastor, we did not discuss. Let me show that in Hebrew here. We do, I know you know it, but I think most people don't know. What is the name Knaan? You know, the, the meaning of the word Knaan, and uh, I, some of you know it, you know what's the meaning? There is no coincidental names in Hebrew. Nothing is coincidental. Every name has a meaning. Moses in Hebrew is masha. It's a verb in Hebrew, means to, I make up a word in English now, to disimmerse out of water. To take something, to pull out something from water is masha. That's Moses' name. And there is a great story. I keep on teaching, teaching it everywhere I go. And the name was Balaam. You know, they remember the story of Balaam? Bilam? The, yeah, the dual, Bela, B and L again. Balaam, B and L again, okay, that is, he was a wizard, he, apparently a very powerful one, and Balak ben Sipor, the king, is hiring him in a crucial moment in the history of the world to curse Israel. So he is a super cursor, if you want, super cursor. To curse and to bless, you need one thing that every broadcast company knows. You need to be high above the subjects, you know, that really made itself all the way to the to the universities and podiums. All, you know, the podium is well, we're not higher here, but normally podiums are higher. And why? Because when you do blessing or teaching or anything, you're exerting power, knowledge, power, energy, call it whatever, from above to below. Does it look familiar? I'm dropping the the microphone for a second. It's like broadcasting, casting down a curse or a blessing, in, not in particular in this order, or teaching, and so on. So that man is about to 
um, hired to curse Israel in the crucial moment of, of, of its history on, upon the entry to the Holy Land, the promised land, right? They are down below, he's on the top of the mountain, and he's about to curse, and he puts it, and you know, there are many obstacles, the donkey talks to him, and then, God is trying to stop him somehow, of course he's playing with him, because he could strike him dead in a second, but he let it happen. He let it happen until the very second, last second, you know, the name Balaam in Hebrew, made up of two words, Bela, B and L, evil, bad, confusion, conf you know, all the bad thing in that two letters, and am, so Bela means to speak evil, and am means people. In the moment that that child was born, you know, many years before he got this, this job to curse Israel, what was his mother was doing? He was kind of, come on, little cursor of nations, come here, you want some, you know, treat? That was his name, cursor of a nation. His destiny, so in Hebrew names is the destiny folding into the name. Hebrew names are folding the history. I mean, not the history, the, desti the destiny of a person, okay? And it's, it, wow, you can see it throughout the Bible, but we don't have time for that. I want to get to the other subject. So, um, so the name, so Ham was the father of Canaan, the big time enemy later on of Israel, right? In the land. From this tree, all earth, all the population of the earth had been spread. And Noah became, you know, he became a, a, a man that works on the field. You know, he's a farmer. And they jump quite, quite a long distance from that, a farmer. And of course, he has grapes. And of course, if he has grapes, he drinks. And of course, if he drinks, he gets drunk. So he got drunk, and he was lay uncovered inside the tent. And Ham saw, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, which is forbidden in the Bible, of course, you know. And he tells the two brothers outside, the two brothers is Shem and Yafet, right? They go backwards with some garment, so they won't see it, and they drop it on Noah. And they go backwards and they cover it, and um, the father, he woke up from his uh, hangover, and he knew what his son did to him. Now look, and he says, Arur Knaan Eved Avadim Yele Echav. He says, and he said, Cursed is Canaan, a slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. But in Hebrew, Kana, the, the root of Canaan, Kaf Nun Ein, means in Hebrew to surrender, to submit. Look, the name itself, and it's very easy to skip, even Israelis. You ask them, they will not tell you the answer right on offhand. You know, you need to think really in that kind of term, in that kind of way of thinking, what is the word, mean? what is the meaning of the word? What's the core? So, Kna'an, the name Canaan, Kana in Hebrew, Kuf, na, Nun, Ein, means to surrender, to submit. And the destiny is in the name. It's built into the name, Canaan, you know? All right, so th I thought that was a very good point to mark, to, because you, you meet it throughout the Bible about the Canaanites and Canaan and Canaan, but that's their destiny, and their destiny has been fulfilled from that moment that God himself, right? Uh, Noah, actually Noah was doing this curse, right? Arur Canaan, Eved Avadim Yelechav. Vayomer, and at the same time, he, com he, he, he put it together with the blessing of God. Vayomer, Baruch Adonai Eloi Shem, and he said, Blessed is the Lord, the father of Sam, Shem, right? And Canaan would become a slave to it, to be, he would be enslaved, submitted and surrendered to him. Yeft Elohim Yeft Elohim, it's kind of a play of words. In English, they put God shall enlarge Japheth. In Hebrew, it is more so in the verb, he did beautiful things to him. Yefet from Yefe, from beautiful, you know? So God did great, beautiful things to him, not just enlarge, but made beautiful things. It could be that word too, because if you look at the root, um, it also patach, it's a pay and tav, I don't have time, but it means to open. So there are two meanings to that root. One is to open, for Japheth, you know. And every J in English is Ye in Hebrew. Be aware of that. So Jesse is Yeshai. Jesus is Yeshua and so on. So his name is Yefet. You put Japheth in English, but it's Yefet. 
And it could be he did great, beautiful thing to him, right? And he was uh, dwelling in the, in the tents of Shem, and Canaan was a slave to, he, to him, right? Canaan. This is already a big punishment right from the top, from the beginning. And Noah lived after the, the um, flood for 350 more years. So 600, that was his age in the beginning, 350, that's the time he lived, right? 950 years, am I right? Okay. So yeah, it says 950 years and he died. Chapter 10, well, the, the, the genealogy here, we're going to skip all that. And we go to something interesting I shared with your pastor here. Um, Kind of interesting, in, in uh, chapter 10 of Genesis, verse 7, it says in the son, we're talking about the children of Ham, right? Of Ham, the father of Canaan. He was also the father of Cush, Egypt, and Put. And then it says, and the sons of Cush was Sva, Vechavila, Vesavta. But these two words, Sva or Saba in Hebrew means grandfather. And Savta, spelled a little differently, but the same word, means grandmother, the Savta Khan. It's kind of funny and strange that they appear right here in the name, and that's the word for father, grandfather and grandmother. And then there is something, wow, you're going to like that one in verse 8. I think they're in the same chapter, right? Um, yeah, same chapter, verse 8. And I'm skipping really quickly because I really want to get to the other subject. And Cush gave birth to Nimrod. And he became a great hero in the land. And he, you know, the old stories of Nimrod, who really was Nimrod, right? You know the stories of Nimrod. And he was a hero of a um, hunter, but more than a hunter. And even the Bible here quotes an expression, an idiom that says, and so it would say, Nimrod, Nimrod is a great hero of hunting before God. And then we learn that his kingdom of Nimrod if the beginning of kingdom was in the land of Babel, B L again, Babel, B B B B, and Arad v'tichlena be'eret shinar. Okay, so Nimrod is not just a name, you know. Okay, so he was little of Babel. What did the people? What did the people of Babel do? What are they famous for? What did they do? Build the tower, but what is it? What what was the intention of that action? They are revolting against God, right? Revolting against God. Okay, so the name Nimrod, Nimrod, coming with from the root in Hebrew Marad, M R D, right? And it means <laughs> to mean to rebel, right? So his name is rebellious. The the meaning of his name, and that was the purpose, and that was the destiny folded or unfolding in his name. The destiny of Nimrod was to revolt, right? Okay, so comes now the word that I want to tell you. This is a strong one, the Babel, right? Babel. I'm going to read you something really quickly here about Babel. Babel. Babylon. Babel, Babylon was a significant city in ancient Mesopotamia. Researcher link the etymolo etymological origin of the name to the Akkadian Babli, uh, uh, um, sorry, ba yeah, Babili, um, which reportedly meant gate of God, okay, or gateway of the God, lowercase God. We, of course, prefer to believe the Bible. The people of Babel attempted to build a tower whose top would reach to the hev to heaven. God punished them for their arrogance, and it says, therefore, is the name. The name of it called Babel, Babel, because the Lord did there confuse the language of, uh, of all the earth. Genesis 11, 9, 9. Now, confused in Hebrew is Balal, B-L-L, -L, right? That's to confuse, B-L-L, -L, again, this word. The same two letters, B and L, Bet and Lamed, that are in the word Mabul, the flood. Confusion, mix up, okay? The same letters in Babul. In Babul. The root of confuse in, in Hebrew, you know, most of the roots in Hebrew are three letters normally. Root means the core of every verb, you know, like study, will study, studied, uh, you know, everything that has to do with education is Lamed Mem Dalet. Three letters, okay? Every root, 99, 95% of the Hebrew, 
based on roots, words based on roots, and the roots are three letters roots, normally. Normally, except for in this one. The root of confused in Hebrew is bal, bel, b, l, b, l, twice, you know? <laughs> right, twice, b, l, b, l, to re-emphasize the confusion, the chaos that is hiding in these two characters. This repetition looks, sounds, and means confusing. Notice that B and L in the name of the notorious Canaanite god Baal, the Baal, right? The Baal, that's the notorious god, goddess, you know, lowercase, of, of the Canaanites, the sons of Ham. And it's Baal, and there is a BL there. Be aware of the BLs because they are there to confuse, to confound, and to complicate our lives, you know, those BLs. Another ancient god is called Bel. You remember that name? Bel? B-E-L, right. Is spelled with the same letters. He is connected to the ba to Babylon. Oh, Babylon again, B-N-L, right? In Babylon, Babel. And look at this verse. Babylon is taken. Bel is confounded. And this is Jeremiah 52. Jeremiah 50, verse 2. Okay, Babylon is taken, Bel is confounded. Okay, and also he says, I and I will punish Bel in Babylon. I will pani punish Bel in Babylon. Jeremiah 51, 44. And it's Bel in Babylon is a tongue twister in Hebrew. Listen to that. In Hebrew, it's Bel mi Babel. Bel mi Babel. Be -be 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 a lot of that, you know? Bel mi Babel. Lots of Bs, lots of L. And I think now you know that where blah, blah, and blah, blah, blah are coming from. <laughs> you know, that's basically the, the confusion. BL, blah, blah, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, okay. I, I'm going to skip because I, I really need to get to the other subject here. So they mention the people that came out of that in verse 14 of that chapter, the Patrusim, the Kasluchim, and the Plishtim. This is the name that really the people that now they call themselves after the Philistines. Plishtim are the Philistines. And that's how the Palestinians, so-called, calling themselves. After a nation that is uh, <laughs> not, nothing to do with God, of course, it's a... It's a nation of, of pagans, you know, and uh, I don't even know if they are responsible to call him themselves this way. Look, his history has very interesting um, kind of ups and downs, but besides ups and downs, it has intentional, by naming someone or somebody or place, you are already setting forth the standard. So for four, the Ottoman or Empire, Turkey, ruled the land of Israel for 400 years, exactly 400 years, right? And left in 1940, uh, what is it, 1926, right? But 400 years they ruled the land, and you know what they called the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, you know what they called the land, the Holy Land? They called it the land of Israel, Eretz Israel. They, Muslims, recognized the connection of Israel the people and its land. And they call it the land of Israel. Who took over after World War II, uh, World War I? I mean, no, after that. Who took over the land of Israel? Great Britain. And immediately, the first thing in the Whitehall in London, what is the name that they gave the land? Palestine. So no longer will it be the land of Israel as the Turkish kept for 400 years. And even the Romans, well, the Romans call it Capitol, Ilia Capitolina, but uh, it's still the land of Israel, everybody knew. But now they wiped out, blotted out the name of Israel from the land, and they called it Palestine. Why? Didn't they have enough historians and educated people there in Whitehall in London? You know, they have their great universities of Oxford and Cambridge, and, you know. Didn't they know better that they, to call a land, the whole land, after an evil enemy and foe of Israel that was like idol worshippers that God hated and told Israel to annihilate and destroy them? Instead of calling the land in its real land, it 
gives and coins the word that was extinct. They are not descendants of the Philistines. Nobody, really. They vanished and they perished from the face of the earth, never to come back again until Great Britain re-erected them and resurrected them, a nation that is gone of pagans, and they're calling the Holy Land, the land, I mean, they call it the Holy Land, Palestine. And out of this name came the idea of Palestinians, you know. Although, in, you know, if you look at the, I mean, their culturally and lang lingually, there is no really difference between Arab people, Muslims that live in Palestine, in, in Israel, or so-called Palestine at the time, or in Egypt, or in Jordan, or in Syria, they have the same, you know? Same language, same food, same customs, same habits. So those now called, they're, you know, adopted the name Palestinian. And this whole thing is not really ancient, you know? They did live there. I mean, even the Bible mentioned Arabs in the land. We have to admit that, you know? But they're not called that name, you know? They didn't have a name like that, you know? They're residents of that place. But calling it that name, formed in the 30s, no, 1930s, 1920, not, not earlier than that, the idea, but that's a different subject again, you know. I was teaching a class about uh, like uh, radical Islam, medieval theology and modern politics, very interesting subject, by the way. You, you learn how, how the things, how we even knew about September 11, before September 11, exactly how it's gonna happen, you know. The whole ideology of radical Islam is like clear cut mentioned in their book, you know? But again, it's not our subject, I'm, I'm dropping it right now. So this is the Philistine, and now look, um, and Canaan, look, uh, the, the firstborn of Canaan, the firstborn of Canaan, who was he? Sidon, Sidon. And this is one of the great strongholds of Hezbollah today in Lebanon, Sidon. I've been to that city in 1982. Yes, Sidon, and this is the, the firstborn of Canaan in Sidon. And if you jump back to, not back, forward to the verse 19, both Sidon, where the Hezbollah is now, and they have almost a lot of the rockets that are right there under the ground, and Gaza are mentioned in one verse. Look at that. Verse 19, and the border of the Canaanite was from Sidon as you come to Grar to Gaza. You know, Gaza and Sidon, where Hezbollah is and Hamas is mentioned in one verse in the Bible here. And so was also, not only them, but Sedom and Gomorrah in the same verse. Sedom and Gomorrah, verse 19. All right. Um, I think, I, I, I think you know, there is more here, but let's go to our subject because, you know, um, otherwise I'll, I'll not be able to do the second part, and I, I really want to do that. Let's go to the continuation, okay, if you don't mind. So, um, we call it the astounding time flips in the Hebrew Bible. About a week ago, we can, or two weeks ago, I spoke in a conference. It was a big conference like, uh, of prophecy. And, um, and I, I said to the people, they were, you know, I said, you know, people believe that prophecy in the Bible belongs to the prophet. So it's only in the prophets, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, the 12, the other, Amos. And the answer is no. The answer that prophecy is literally in every verse of the Bible. Every verse is prophetic, and this is not a paraphrase. So what I'm saying here, it's nice, it's sweet. No, there's evidence, okay? So what happens there in the Hebrew Bible that makes almost every verb prophetic, every verb is a prophecy, is something that is, we call it, a, you know, it's a time flip. There is the letter in Hebrew, ve. It's a vav. Pastor is teaching that as a nail, right? In the Hebrew word pictures idea, it's the nail. And it looks like a nail. It looks like a hook or a nail. And it means in Hebrew simply end. If I were to say, you know, what's your name? If I say Danny and Michael, I'll say Danny ve Michael. I put the ve connected to Michael. Or Michael and Danny, Michael ve Danny. Become a prefix. But it's not just an innocent vav. It's not just an innocent end. And it's not a standalone. It's connected to the next word. 
In the Bible, in Hebrew, it is the flipping vav, that's the name of the letter, from present to future and vice versa. Vice versa. What does that mean? Go and look at even in the very beginning when God creates the earth and it says, Vayomer Elohim Yehi Or. And God said, in, in your English it says, let there be light, although he never said that, you know. Um, so in your English Bible it says, and God said, let there be light. He, didn't, he never said, let there be light, but he said something else. But I want to stand on, on something else. He said, Vayomer. Yomer in Hebrew, Yud, every, you know, you can hear the yo, yeah, yeah. A yud in the beginning of a verb is always in the future, okay? So what is going on here? But the vav before, it says va yomer Elohim. And God said, that flips it, that vav flips it from the future to the past. And that verse means really, and God said, okay? Because the verb itself is in future tense. But that vav flips it to the past. We can tell it in your English normal narrative, right? And God said, but he didn't say, let there be light. What he rather says there, and that's the tense that does not in exist in English, but it's a tense in Hebrew called the imperative. So what is he saying there? Is he saying, yehi or. Yehi or does not mean let there be light. It's a very, let there is a very weak expression. It kind of hints to the idea that God is asking, so for some apparatus to create the light. Say, let there be light, and he's waiting, bingo, it worked, you know. No. So it, that, that, it, it didn't work this way. The principle that is coined in what he said there is a very important one. God's word is also the action. No room or need for mediation. Let there be light. It's like, let there be kind of, it, it, it indicates it should be some waiting and see if it worked. It worked. I oh, didn't. Let's try. No. He says, be light. Be light. And that's the command. That's an imperative. And as he says that, there was light right away. No mediation, no time lapsing, no gap between the word of God uttered and the action to take place. But there is, as Pastor used to say, but there is more. <laughs> there is more. You heard him saying it many times, right? But there is more here too. A big time more. You know, there is something we call the tetragrammaton in Hebrew, Shem HaHavaya. That's the essence name of the Lord, okay? The name of the Lord, Havaya. And I don't say it in Hebrew. I really don't. And it's made of four, made up of four characters. Yud, He, Vav, and He. You call it the, uh, you know, all those names. And there is a group, some people don't understand. They say, there is a group there, they knock on your door, and they are the witnesses, yeah? So you got the name, right? So that name, I don't say it, and you know, People say, ah, come on, why are you trying to be that pious and then you don't say it, you know? And it's really hard to explain because people say the name of the Lord and they use that name and I don't. And what, am I better than anybody? I'm not, you know? But, you know, people ask that and there was an embarrassing moment in a conference once of the, it was a conference of the Messianic leaders of America. And uh, I was invited to speak, but I'm not a leader, you know, I'm just a teacher. And uh, the president was talking, you know, and he was using that name a lot, you know. I didn't say, I finished my speech and I sat down, but the mediator is a rabbi from Texas, and he said, oh, I see that, Danny McGee wants to say something. I said, no, I don't want to say anything, you don't embarrass me. He said, no, I do see that he wants to say something. And I was like, I really, what, what are you doing to me? I mean, I'm not gonna embarrass now the president of this organization, I'm just, a t you know. Oh, come, come. And he, the president said, oh, I don't mind if you want to say, you know, put me on the spot. I mean, very embarrassing, you know. So I didn't know how to get out of that. And I looked at the audience and I picked a man that looked young enough to have a living father, you know. <laughs> young enough. And I said, what's your name? And he said, name. I said, what's your father's name? He said, David. And I said, okay, let's put it this way. You want to talk, you need some help. And you call your father, and I kind of mimic a phone. And say, you call your father and say, hey, Dave, I need 500 bucks. Would you send it to me? And he said, no, no. He was very appalled. No, no. 
So what did I get wrong? You didn't you tell me his name is David? Ah, okay, let's do it again, I tell him. Okay, no Dave. Okay, let's do it again. So I'm calling and say, hey, David, I need 500 bucks. Would you send it to me? He said, no, no, no. I said, what is going on here? You just told me his name is David. You need something. I said, oh, let's softer. David, I need 500. No, what, anyway, it doesn't work. He said, no, no. So where is the problem? So what, do you, what, what did you call him? And so I'll call, I'll say, Dad. So why would you do that? I mean, his name is David. So I guess out of respect. And I said, well, would you consider at least have equal amount of respect to your heavenly father? I mean, you know, I mean, there are 341 or 42 names for God. The Almighty El Shaddai, you know, bah, 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 a lot of names. Adonai, Elohim, Hashem, that, you name it. So, and one of them is the essence name of the Lord. The essence. Now, let me tell you what I mean by essence, okay? Why is it really essence name of the, of Lord, of the Lord? Those four letters, Yud, Hei, Vav, Hei, really um, manifest or kind of are everywhere. They are part of your DNA, each one of us. It's part of our DNA. How? Four letters being part. Number one, the first hint was when he said, be light, but be in Hebrew is Yud, Hey Yud. Oh, so he is creating using his name. This is Yah, you know? Yud, Hey is Yah, his name, and another Yud. Each one of these letters stands for God's name in Hebrew. Yud is God's name, Hey in God's name. But together, Yud, Hey, and Yud is using his name for the creation. But if you look at the many of the levels of existence that we know as people, we know past, right? We can relate to past, we can relate to future, and we can relate to present. So, past in Hebrew is was, to say was, is Haya. It's Hey, Yud, and Hey. Wow, again, God's name in the past. All right, what about future? Yihye will be. Yud, hey, yud, hey. Twice the word ya in the word will be. Wow, so if the skeptical, they are still skeptical, say, ah, that's a coincidence. I mean, interesting, but coincident. Look at the word present in Hebrew. Hove, just like the name, you know. Hey, Vav, and Hey, three letters of his name. Just the Yud is not there. So, wow. So, everything about future, past, and present is already in his name. And he creates the world with his name. He says, Be, and the word Be that God says is God's name, is, is uh, Yehi, right? But it's using his name for creation. That might be a hint. Why out of 613 commandments in the Bible, most of which don't relate to ordinary people. That has to do with sacrifices and so on, and many other things. But 613, 10 of them made it to the top of the chart, right? 10. The top of the chart, top chart. One of those 10, the important one, says in Hebrew, you shall not take... In English, not in Hebrew. In English, you should not take my name in vain. In Hebrew, it's not take. It's you should not lift up my name in vain. Nasa, lotisa. So if, Hebrew is very precise and accurate. You can say a word to a person, you can say, but you can't say God's name. And you also cannot say a prayer in Hebrew. So that great song of, who sang it? Aretha Franklin? Say a little prayer for me. Who said it? Who sang it? Aretha Franklin, right? That cannot work in Hebrew. You cannot say a prayer in Hebrew. You can only lift up a prayer. So the word is nasa tfila, nasa, lift up a prayer. Because say is a vector line. You talk to another person, you can speak and say something to a person, not to God. To God, you lift up your words. That's a direction. Likewise, a prayer, likewise, any speaking with God has a direction. So that's why the commandment in Hebrew relates to God's name. It says you should not lift up the name of God, your, your Adonai, your God, in vain. Question is, what is in vain? If somebody prayed for the healing of a person, you know, very important, you would say that's not in vain. What if he's praying to the success of his son in medical school? 
you all that and says the name of the Lord, then he said, not in vain because it's going to save people and then it's important. What if he's praying for whatever, you know? What if he's praying for a green Bentley and a, and a silver Mercedes, one for weekdays and one for weekends? And he uses the name of God. Most people say, well, that might be in vain, you know, a little bit. No, not really, but maybe a little bit, you know. Okay, so if that's in vain, and where is the border between what is in vain and what is not in vain? Since we don't know the fine line, there is two approaches in the Hebrew mindset to relate to the commandments of God. You'll be surprised that Jesus took the one of them. You know which one? You don't know? Okay. Two, way to, two ways to treat the law. Not the law that is canceled. You know, that kind of stuff. People keep on repeating that. What does it mean that the law, we're not under the law? So you can take a knife and kill someone. You can rape. Uh, what law we're not under? Certain laws, right. Okay, but the law of God is still on earth, and Christians are abided by that law. All of us, you know. So... Um, um, so it says there, you should not take up my name in vain, or lift up the name in vain. So we don't know what in vain really means and where is the borderline. So there are two approaches to how do we interpret what God is requesting. One of them is called kula. Means in Hebrew, no big deal. Kula, light, ah! You know, you're driving, you see a sign, and it says... 50 miles an hour, and it's a chin. No, no, Frank was totally there. No cops in the area, you drive 75, and no big deal. You take the law lightly, you know, no big deal. That's, a pro, that's called kula. So you take the law, and it says, don't need that. You say, ah, no big deal. We can do that, you know. The other one, interestingly enough, Jesus took it, and you can see, it's called humra. Humra means to the severe point of the law. Severe means extreme. Meaning, even, even if there is 1% of chance of transgression, will not take it. That's, that's humra in the severe. So Jesus said there, if, even if you look at that woman there, you already committed adultery. Just looking, really? Humra. It's severe. Because some people say, oh, but we know the heart. He knew the heart of man. So this is already a sin. That's a humra. This is one of the, and in, any, in many other areas, he took the humra. The, the approach is humra and not kula. And this is, comes to the power here too. You can say, that I'm personally not saying, telling anyone what to do. I'm nobody, you know, I'm a simple teacher. But you decide, and this is up to any one of you, how do you relate to that. I just explain where is this kind of, you know, this, why Jews are not saying it. What's the problem? This is the problem. They take the humra. The severe, and even though it's nice to say the name, well, come in the name of the Lord, there are many names of the Lord. Okay? So, okay, let's go to the time flip. So this Vav, what? Time? Time? Two minutes. Okay. Okay, I'll wrap it up. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, I'll just get to one that I cannot help not saying it. And God said to Moses... In your English, it says, I am what I am. Right? 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 People at home, right? Wrong. He never said that. And he said, thus shall you say to the people of Israel, I am has sent, you to, uh, sent me to you, Exodus 3.14. Actually, he's saying, listen to the words. Listen to the words. In Hebrew, he says, Eheye asher eheye. Aleph, hey, yud, and hey. Again, part of his name. The yud, hey, yud. You know, this is, and, and that's again, remember, Aleph in the beginning is a verb in the future tense. So he is saying the most prophetic statement of the whole Bible. More than any other prophet, he says, I will be whatever I will be. And you tell them who sent you, I will be sent you. The prophet can say, I am, because he's a, any prophet. He is aware that right now he is, but he's not there in the future. Idea is not immortal. And not Ezekiel and not any other prophet. But God can say, I will be whatever I will be. Future-oriented, very prophetic, 
very strong. Remember that. Please come next week. We have great stuff on the Torah portion of next week. Thank you so much. Thank you.